Hello and um, welcome to my podcast. I'm your host, uh, Larry Liu, and uh, today I'm joined by uh, Mike Poole. So welcome to the podcast. Oh, welcome, Larry. Nice to talk to you again. Uh, been yeah, a while. so yeah, it's been a while. So, uh, so we wanted to start with uh, the Austrian elections. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it, it is going to happen Sunday. Uh, right? Well, actually, today because we're a little bit after nine p.m. Eastern time in the U.S. Yeah, uh, three a.m. in uh, Central Europe um, on Sunday. So. Which means for them it's going to be uh, election day, um, and we're going to know the results of those elections probably by uh, early afternoon, um, you know, Eastern time here, um, and they'll, you know, finish counting. I think I want to say six or seven p.m. I think they'll start to have the first uh, calculations uh, as to, um, yeah, like who probably. Uh, won the election, um, and then I, and I think the the process of counting all of the votes, uh, which includes the mail in ballots, uh, will probably be uh, another week uh, after that. Um, but that usually doesn't swing too much. Uh, I, I I did listen to uh, uh, O twenty four, uh, which is uh, you have the, these political experts. Uh, including former politicians uh, who kind of talk about um, the election prognosis. Uh, now, the former name? politicians are very biased, obviously. So one is from the SPO, one is from the FPO, right. um, the Socialists and the and, and the Freedom Party, the Nationalists. Um, but, uh, yeah, so... I mean, r right now, I mean, with the polls, it's pretty tight, interestingly. Um, so, uh, I, I think that it's the, uh, OVP and then the FPO, uh, that, uh, are, are doing, uh, quite well, I would say in the polls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, um, I was watching, uh, Marcos Lanz, uh, show today. I think it was one day delay. So they had it on Thursday and their focus uh, was on Herbert Kickel, uh, who I guess is sort of the leader in the FPÖ, uh, or he's the main kind of focus person. And they were drawing parallels to his rhetoric and uh, style that simulates uh, Viktor Orban style in uh, Hungary, and almost verbatim, you know, like anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric and uh, anti-EU and uh, so, yeah, it's a big concern, you know, but Austria, you know, has has far right, just like Germany has far right and the Netherlands has far right parties, populist parties. But yeah, so uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, for Austria, you know, what uh, what impact populist parties will have in the new uh, elected parliament. Yeah. But yes. definitely, definitely, the immigration topic is is a big topic, and uh, they were talking about it on the show for you know, I guess about an hour. <laughs> it's quite interesting to have a, uh, you know, uh, to view it as a viewer, but also to kind of see what what they're talking about. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, migration topic. I think that's uh, quite huge. Uh, because uh, there, there was a significant number of people, I would say after 2015, I think that's when, you know, uh, a paradigm shift has occurred. Uh, and uh, you see an increase uh, in the number of uh, migration. Um, and, uh, and it has become, you know, very controversial. Um, yeah, so th that's definitely one topic that people can mobilize around. Um, and then the second topic uh, is going to be about inflation and uh, the, the rising prices, um, which, uh, b b I mean, it, it targets people all around the world, I would say, um, um, because, you know, there were 
supply chain snafus uh, because there were, you know, uh, the COVID pandemic and then there was, you know, the war in Ukraine. Uh, now we have a new war in the Middle East, right, uh, that's happening around um, Israel and Gaza and Lebanon. Um, so, you know, all of these supply chains are being, you know, they're being made uncertain, right? Um and um yeah so uh and and it makes um yeah life quite uh difficult for a lot of people in the in the rich countries um and uh, and and now you know and and then the other factor would be i would say climate change uh so uh i believe, I believe it was 2 weeks ago when we had these flooding right uh big flooding that happened in um northeastern part of austria which is also the population center um and um yeah so i mean it's essentially i mean you have weather patterns that get stuck mm -hmm. right uh so you have you know significant uh moisture uh brought from the mediterranean uh, up to central europe and yeah if you don't if you if you have these you know, blocking patterns, uh, it means that you might have these heavy rains that circulate for about a week or so, and they then become concentrated in those areas. Um, yeah, and if you are very unlucky to live in a region where uh, a lot of the moisture is concentrated, um, you know, you're going to face the flooding. Yeah. Um, Vienna actually is one of the places that was better off um because i saw videos uh where you could see like the danube river the main river where most of the water uh, would be diverted to um but um and uh and, and certainly like the area right next to the river that was flooded right think of like the embankment um but the area where the actual city is like the street level uh that was higher up and so the streets themselves were not flooded and uh you know um and that, that's like over hundreds of years i mean the viennese you know have developed a uh, i think a very effective way to um insulate the city itself flooding from flooding yeah um but if you, but if, look if you live in the province like in lower austria uh the surrounding province of surrounding vienna um th that's where a lot of the heavy damages are going to be um you know uh, same thing that we saw like yeah yesterday and today in in Asheville and in north carolina yeah. um uh, florida yeah yeah florida there was been floods as well uh the eastern Big topic uh tennessee as well so um and it's interesting because because those regions like they, they did not have the hurricane themselves, oh, okay. but they have the after effects uh, of that hurricane, right? You know, yeah, uh, still, significant moisture. Yeah, it's uh, certain times. Yeah, I want to go briefly back to this, uh, you know, flooding uh, in Austria and. Um, few months ago also i think in uh germany but uh i wonder why you know the greens uh haven't been able to mobilize on this um uh, you would think ecological topics you know even in austria i think i don't know how well the austrian greens are doing uh but uh in in germany too the the greens they always had an environmental base you know and there was a lots of environmental voting and concerns about global warming but what do you think why why isn't that sometimes the, the uh you know you would think with all these ecological problems and flooding people would start voting <laughs> greens more but they're not able to tap into it somehow i don't know or they uh don't have as good voter turnout or uh one would again one would think that at least in europe you know because you have uh smaller parties that have environmental topics but, what do you think? Why that happens? I mean, why can't the Greens, for instance, pick up on those issues and get more voters 
even if they have these floodings, it seems to not always turn out, I guess, politically in their favor. Yeah, well, I mean, there's this general issue uh, of, you know, like, what is scarcity doing to the voter base? And uh, I think that there are, you know, real issues of scarcity right uh, that um come from you know excessive damages you know flood damages or fire damages um it can also come from you know neoliberalism right you know lack of secure jobs right maybe amazon and uh walmart are probably the only safe jobs and equivalents in european countries um and uh yeah and also there's more ethnic diversity there's more immigration right um and and all of these things they kind of signal to a certain population uh that that times are scarce um and in it, and and i think you know I, I think a natural psychological reaction uh to uh, uh scarcity uh is to uh I mean, I mean, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's to find yeah. scapegoats and then to find kind of like more the simple solutions uh, versus, uh, I mean, if, yeah, if you listen to like, you know, the Green parties, um, they they kind of have, uh, you know, a somewhat seemingly technocratic approach, uh, technocratic yeah. solutions. And, uh, and, and those are not particularly uh, appealing, I would say. Um, and um, so... Uh, that that's why I think, yeah, it it might be very difficult to make that, uh, you know, strong case, uh, th right. that uh, the environment is one of the burning issues that people are facing. Um, look, I mean, you know, if my house was flooded, I mean, like probably climate change is the last thing on my mind, right? It's it's kind of like, right. how do I get my life back together again? You know, how do I? restore uh, my house my car and so forth that's been destroyed so um and um yeah and so if you have scarcity i think people become more receptive to uh you know the rattenfang is a german term right the yeah, rat catchers yeah, yeah. uh you know people that um you know have seemingly simple solutions but they uh, don't do anything to improve people's lives um I mean, like if you, if you look at the the Freedom Party in Austria, right, where they try to blame everything on the migrants, and yeah. I mean, if you have like a very serious crisis, like you know the climate crisis, right, the the, the flood events, uh, then th then they don't really have any real solutions, right? They're just saying, well, you know, we just have to uh, increase the you know flood damage you know, uh, repair costs, right? That should be paid by the state. And then they say, well, you know, we're going to be able to pay for that because we're going to cut the waste and the bureaucracy and the corruption, et cetera. You know, without saying, of course, that, you know, the FPO was, has been one of the most corrupt parties when they were in government. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was several times. I mean, they ended the government because of some issues regarding corruption right um financial uh, scandal right yeah. yeah i mean it's oftentimes it's it's like it's just you know pocketing money that you know they sh probably should not have right mm -hmm. um and um yeah but 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 again you know it's about you know, i'm presenting to you a simple solution and you should vote for me and and people understand that message right if 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 it is about you know, taking away stuff from the migrants, I think people understand that. You know, when I say that, you know, the climate is causing you to damage uh, or, you know, automation is taking you away your job, um, that that's a much harder case to make. Um, I, I, th I think you might require a little bit more reading, uh, education and things like that, right? Yeah. You think that this uh, is partly also explained because voters and people generally misunderstand disasters and risks i mean or they confuse what is a disaster and what is a risk and like you said 
politics seems to reframe it as look seeking scapegoats but you know you and i are sociologists you know we try to make a career out of examining the sociology of disasters and uh you know, I told you uh, a couple of days ago that I've been kind of looking at putting together a future course, but uh, sociology of disaster, you know, like how a lot of the things that we talk about, uh, at least we uh, see in the news, you know, or there's uh, uh, environmental change and there's flooding and there's a hurricane like every week, you know. And where I actually, you know, uh, live very close in Texas uh, and in the south, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, this is becoming more severe now, you know, with more and more environmental uh, damage. And it's a disaster, you know, for, for a lot of people. Uh, and it's going to continue to happen, you know. And my my interest is how, how does society respond? How do the institutions respond? How does the state respond, you know, and how various actors and how does the media frame it sometimes? That's that's like my interest, I guess. So I'm kind of advocating for the if I get to put together this course, <laughs> I would try to, you know, address some of those topics with good literature and good readings, you know. And uh, but I think that would be interesting if people ever thought about that. This is something systematic disasters and how we respond to them. Uh, shouldn't just be something academic, but like a concern to all of us, you know. <laughs> and I mean, you can go, you can, I mean, anybody has access to Wikipedia. I mean, you can look at all the major disasters, whether it's environmental, industrial, the Popal India disaster, the Deep Water Horizon oil spill, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, Fukushima, right? Chernobyl. Um, some. Uh, some are man-made, some are, you know, ecological, but uh, we always have some influence in how we respond, what precautions we take, or we take any at all, any lessons, you know. So uh, let me make one point uh, to the listeners and, and even, you know, you, Larry, like I was thinking about people in vulnerable areas like Florida or uh, the coastal areas of uh, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, like Texas coast and Louisiana. Um, how can people live there in the future? If, you know, you're going to have a hurricane during hurricane season, you know, at least coastal areas where there's a good chance your house can get, you know, destroyed, you get flooded. Uh, we're going to have to maybe think that, in some areas, it would be very difficult for people to, to live and to have an economy there. Uh, that's why even insurance companies don't want to sometimes <laughs> insure certain areas of Florida because it could, uh, from a uh, financial standpoint, it's uninsurable, you know. <laughs> but yeah, some no, areas, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, if, if, yeah, you look, if, if, if you look at like, you know, Asheville, like, you know, North yeah. Carolina, I think that there are also a lot of places that are basically lying further inland and uh you know and they themselves uh you know they, they don't really have you know they didn't buy flood insurance we you know because maybe they thought that well you know they're further inland they don't have to worry about it as much uh but uh but if you have these crazy weather storms these crazy weather events um you know it, it could be that um that it is you know that you still need to have that insurance even though you never purchased it right and um yeah so th there's like risks that are spreading like all around in society and um and there's going to be some areas that are going to be more vulnerable first uh i would say that even florida is one of the more privileged places in the world because you know it's still part of you know it's still a rich place. I mean, if you go to global north, yeah, global. north. Yeah, it's still yeah. a global north country. Yeah, I mean, if you look at, um, yeah, like basically, like Jakarta, where, right? <laughs> yeah, like Jakarta, where we, Indonesia, uh, Jakarta, right, right. yeah. Well, like where do we source our migrants, right? So we have a lot of them are com coming from the triangle countries, uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador. And um, I mean, a lot of these places, I mean, you could say, okay, they have, you know, violence, uh, there's cartel activity uh, ongoing, there's drug trading, but um, 
you know the you know, the climatic situation is also not great uh i mean it might be hard to grow crops grow food and uh and oftentimes it is a position of desperation that uh creates the migration impetus to migrate right um so there are, so around the world um th that's one of the core inequalities that we should be studying right yeah um which is you know who's going to be impacted first i mean who can least afford to uh stay in the area that they live in um uh the, the us um is like we, we're going to be screwed uh as well i mean if you have if you accept the titanic you know the sinking ship metaphor um you know we risk. just we're the risk society right <laughs> yeah i mean we just get to be in the first class right i mean the first class yeah. was uh close to the top of the ship right which means that the water was uh kind of uh going there the last um and uh and then the third class right the lowest class uh of the, sh of the ship passengers were um i think at the closest to the bottom of the ship right um yeah you know where the yeah. water was filling up first uh so um yeah and so ultimately i think you know we we just it's it's just about you know buying time uh and uh delaying uh delaying the the delaying the inevitable to some extent yeah i think that's it's it's kind of that's that's kind of the world that we live in at this point yeah we want to bring something else in i mean uh you know i i frequently watch these documentaries and uh that are really quite good you know they do one on the popal india disaster and then they they had one on netflix uh regarding the fukushima uh disaster and uh deep water horizon they turned that into a movie uh so i think sometimes surprisingly i mean uh movies and are coming out and it, it, they go viral and people will have a, an opportunity to watch this uh but it's sort of seen as entertainment that's the thing i worry about like sometimes when i see these uh even on apollo 13 you know there was a kind of what was a challenger uh, the challenger uh uh disaster where the the space shuttle uh there was a, it ex exploded so i think sometimes what happens with with media that we watch and consume uh, uh we forget to do a, an analysis and we start to treat it as entertainment or you know uh that these are real people that are affected and these are deci decisions that are made uh regarding whether we have any precautionary policy or we regulate certain industries you know or uh just miscalculation when it comes to management you know so that's one thing i mean uh when i watch documentaries i can sometimes get a basic background information i mean even about popal india when that happened that chemical uh disaster in the 1980s that killed thousands you know and i look at that kind of a disaster i mean then you can get background knowledge and then you can look at similar instances but you know with different kind of industries you know like let's say deep water horizon which is like an oil uh well like in the, the gulf of mexico and it there was miscalculation uh not enough safety standards things like that and then it it, it blew up right so you have similar events with similar kind of themes or patterns and then you can look at them and say yeah this is this, this is a kind of uh uh trend even in the 21st century you know we have all this technology but we still are, are on we don't sometimes know how to control it you know or we we can't predict it or we, our, our systems won't allow us to predict such risks you know that's all i'm gonna add to that so all i'm getting at i think movies and such when people watch them uh maybe we're just getting entertained but, and even if you watch cnn sometimes i mean people like the the storm chasers you know and they they ride close enough to the tornado right um so it's a kind of it becomes like a movie uh to some people yeah right? I, I, people, I did watch the movie uh there was a, a storm twister. chaser yeah twister yeah. i think it was called yeah no, it's there's like an appeal. I guess it's a kind of a, a new kind of a, a t entertainment. You know, it turns into a culture industry. You know, and people, uh, you, you can uh, again turn it into movies, and often that's the case. You know, 
and we re don't realize that those are real events that had real severe consequences uh, and the decisions that were made were consequential and that's why it happened you know um, that's just my critique <laughs> that we turn everything into inter entertainment right yeah and uh, also it's a it's this is a very you know weird yeah. movie in my view because uh, i mean they, they had some very serious scenes Right, where mm. you know the main protagonists were kind of getting killed, right? Uh, yeah. But but then there was also, um, yeah, as you say, the storm chasers, like people that were like completely enthusiastic and kind of like a paparazzi, but they're yeah, paparazzi natural, and natural you know, disasters, you know. Yeah, let's capture this event, right? Uh, and 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 then they were showing like this guy with. With his like fancy jeep, right? Uh, that can basically attach itself to the ground, right? So that yeah, it's yeah, yeah. not going to be swept away uh, by by the storm. Uh, and yeah, it it made it seem like that the storm mm -hmm. was controllable by humans, right? Mm -hmm. And I I think that mm -hmm. you know generally we as humans, I think we we are attempting uh, to be God, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think a good movie is simply pointing out that well, we are incapable of, right, you know, being being a God. I, I think ultimately, you know, nature uh, stands above humans, and mm. uh, and unless we live in harmony with it. Um, you know, we're going to be uh, crushed by it, um, and um, and yes, I, I think right now all of the indications are that you know we are, you know, uh, going to have a very hard landing. Uh, I, I spoke with yeah. Yeah. a state senator recently because uh, he came to a university because of a funding uh, center, and um, and we were talking about. Uh, you know the, the state of Maryland and like their plans to do you know carbon neutrality and there is right now uh, the state of gov the state government has a plan to do carbon neutrality by 2045, right? Um, which you might say, okay, you know it's only 20 years away. Um, and and and, and yes, I mean there's the significant. You know uh, uh, adjustments that would you know have to be made um, in order to achieve that objective. But but I'm just wondering, like you know, um, is that is that the right pace? You know, is that going to be enough? Yeah, uh, twenty years is a long skins? time. <laughs> yeah, is this a voluntary plan or just a uh, like they think the market industries will just kind of go along or is it more like a state sponsored uh... well it's it's a state plan right okay. Uh, okay. which means that uh, uh the, the state you know puts forward a target uh and then and then you have to propose an implementation plan uh for the energy companies transportation companies okay. um for like home builders construction uh yeah like food agriculture I mean, every industry um, is going to be affected um, if you want to get to that, you know, net zero target, right? Um, and I was listening to Bloomberg Radio today, and uh, they were saying even when we go to uh, net zero, that we're not going to completely get rid of uh, all gasoline products, right? There'll still be some people, uh, some industries will be, uh, polluting with the gasoline, um, but uh, but there will be probably more offsetting work that needs to be done, right? Yeah. Uh, so you know more carbon storage, carbon capture, you know other things to basically, um, you know compensate, uh, for, for this um, transition. Right? Yeah, I mean, like you know, if, 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 yeah, for the burning of the fossil fuel in other sectors, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and uh, yeah, I mean, we we hope that it's 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 gonna get there. I mean, the, the big discussion right now is to, um, you know, go back to the nuclear power plants. Um, I I believe that there is some 
uh nuclear industry um uh okay. in, in Maryland uh but uh, but I was also told that a lot of the electricity uh is actually being um Im imported from Pennsylvania oh, really? um because Pennsylvania has like natural oh, gas um uh all of the uh, gas that's being brought in basically hit next door oh. um yeah so we have about yeah i think there should be four uh, nuclear power plants up here really um, in maryland wow. no 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 there's only one a calvert cliff oh. nuclear power plants okay okay um yeah yeah uh so but uh but yeah i mean and also like i i saw somewhere that yeah so the nuclear plants are in such high demand like the technology companies themselves uh who are operating um you know huge like algorithms um yeah. they want to run the algorithms on huge data centers huh. and uh and i saw there was one case i think it was, maybe it was amazon where they were trying to acquire uh, the nuclear plant in Pennsylvania. Amazon was. I believe so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, They're going uh, big now, huh? Well, yeah, yeah. With power, too. You already have the everything else. The, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the idea simply is to um, run these computations um, because, you know, if you run, if you want your AI models to be working well, you need uh, a lot of compute, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that compute requires a significant amount of electricity. Yeah. So all of this artificial intelligence, uh, a lot I of think, power, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so an, an average chat GPT's uh, prompt is going to take, I think, five times more electricity than a Google search. Um, okay. So uh, it's it's going to be like ev everything that we're doing is going to be much more uh computing intense um yeah. and, uh, and 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 then you're going to start having issues um you know b yeah. because you know if like because if, if our electric you know demand is going to go up exponentially are we going to uh be able to reach those you know carbon neutrality targets it's a big question right yeah it is um, so, uh, but then at yeah. the same time, I mean, nobody's saying that, you know, we should stop the AI, right? Right, right. <clears throat> so it's a balancing act, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Well, definitely. Yeah, yeah. so there's a, there's a great uh, desire to, to run the, you know, AI. Um, we could always go the Ul Ulrike Hermann route and just ban it all. <laughs> right, ban the, ban Ulrike, Ul Ulrike Hermann, yeah. Which I haven't seen her that, uh, uh, in talk shows lately, but you remember on the Marcos Lan show, there were several cases of uh, uh, debates uh, that Ulrike Hermann had. And, you know, uh, I don't know how, how this yeah would be viewed by uh, individuals that are anti-technology, maybe or anti, I don't know, fearful of AI and... Is, uh, yeah, I have not heard uh, Hermann's yeah. position on AI at this yeah, point. I, um, I know it on cars. She thinks we should ban more of them. But I'm not, even I'm electric not, cars, to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just consume less. We need to reduce our consumption behavior and uh, consume less and uh, shrink, shrink, shrink. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, AI stuff, Larry. Yeah, I mean, your yeah. shrinking economy. I think that I th I think we are kind of you know moving in that direction anyway. Um, yeah. I think that uh, you know there are two factors that are gonna punch us really hard uh, when it comes to the economy. I think uh, the first is simple demographics. Yeah. I mean, I just saw the numbers uh, on Twitter. I think um, you know the. Fertility rate in Canada, just up north, uh, last year was one point two two, um, which wow. is uh, extremely low. Um, yeah, almost like South Korea, right? Yeah, in South Korea, I think it's point seven. Um, 
you know, it, I I did see that it like it it went up like marginally now. I think perhaps in South Korea, but not not that much. Um, and um, yeah. So so that demographic transformation is huge. Um, because ultimately, I think the number of mouths that you feed, I think, is the the main variable. I would say behind um, you know, GDP. Uh, now you could make the argument that, you know, GDP per capita in let's say the poorer countries can still increase a lot, uh, which means that you can have a shrinking population with rising consumption, if the increase in the per capita GDP is uh, is is at a higher rate uh, than the decline in the population. So that's still possible, uh, for a while. Um, but uh, but I think. You know th that eventually is going to, uh, you know, settle down as well, right? Um, yeah, I mean, and and it's also like because you have the mass migration that's happening, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, which, if you say mass migration, I mean, we're still talking like, you know, less than four percent of the global population that, you know, lives in a country that uh they're not born from, right? Yeah. Um. So, uh, yeah, so th th I think that's one factor punching against the economy. Uh, and I think the second one is going to be the climate because, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the costs that are going to be imposed um, on societies um, are going to rise further and further, right? Um, I mean, like, for instance, like if you're like a construction company in Asheville, uh, you might say, hey, it's great that... You know, the floods are coming because you know everybody's going to call me to yeah, help sure. them rebuild the homes and the businesses and stuff. Um, but 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 what 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 if the floods are coming back? You know, in five years, right? Yeah. Like, is well, there a point re more repeatedly? You mean like as, as a permanent disaster? Yeah, I mean, like, like then the, the question yeah. is like, what what's the point of investing in the in the repair and recovery? Um. You know, so um, now, yeah, so, I, so, go ahead. I thought about this more and more myself. You know, I had the same thought. I was thinking, think of the money the state spends uh, to recover from disasters, and uh, when the electric poles fall down, and all of the money it takes to put the electricity back up to to build to fix the houses. You know. Um, to move people back in and to, uh, to have a business, the cost it, it takes just to maintain that, it must be ridiculous over time, you know, especially in areas that are going to experience this more and more and more. Now, there are some things that people will do. They're very proactive. So even in coastal areas of uh, Texas, they start putting board, uh, wooden boards up and they try to raise their houses, you know, so that the it's a little bit minimizing the flood damage. But what happens, I think, is often the infrastructure is so weak uh, to begin with. Uh, every time there's a storm, you know, things get kind of uh, broken up. And there's there's definitely some businesses can profit off of it, can profit off of a, uh, a crisis or can profit off of the necessity of her. Like think of uh, power generators, you know, or uh, because people need it and they need the power. So then it, power generators can go very expensive. They become a scarce commodity, right? Um, so something I've noticed is when there's a disaster and, and like a, a hurricane comes in, a lot of the power companies will hire contractors outside of their own state. And they bring in all these power, uh, you know, they, they put the poles back up, they put the power lines. But it's enormous amount of monetary exchange. I mean, there's an enormous amount of money in there. The state also kind of, you know, assists. So it is a big uh, question of if that's economically sustainable, you know, and just trying to just uh, fix it and knowing that it's going to be, you know, in, in, in three months, four months later, you're going to have hurricane season again and you're going to do it all over again. So it's a dilemma, <laughs> you know. So I'm really trying to think it through, but I was like, well, when you know that this is going to happen every six months, you know. <laughs> especially coastal areas of like Louisiana or Texas, Florida, uh, especially, how is that financially feasible? You know, 
Uh, well, I mean, your yeah, short, yeah, yeah, short term it creates demand, right? Uh, yeah. so it creates jobs, but then you always have to look long term, right? Where yeah. you, you're not spending the money on other things that people might be interested yeah. in enjoying, uh, and uh, so. So overall, I think society is going to experience uh, significant losses, and those losses are going to uh, increase over time, for sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we have to, you know, pre prepare people for the for that kind of future. But, but I mean, how, how do you prepare anybody? Well, uh, for it, right? Well, surprisingly, I mean, I look at academic institutions. They now started providing uh, uh, new kind of majors and f departments even called emergency management. I don't know if you ever uh, heard of it. Uh, and uh, those are like programs that where they have, have, you know, academic professors and degrees where people end up working in these emergency management positions. So a lot of times cities will hire an emergency management kind of director, you know, or, or, or a staff that just deal with that like if there's a disaster you know they literally uh have jobs um but that's what's interesting how even academic institutions kind of respond uh to such disasters and they train they train people you know and look it up you ever have chance emergency management programs uh especially throughout the south i think have started to take off more and more um again i'm you know i'm noticing how there's an attempt to try to fix it, you know, but then you have jobs that are created in that area, uh, opportunities, uh, but. Yeah, know. oftentimes, I mean, you know, just like in capitalism, yeah. uh, it's oftentimes more profitable to pay for patch ups mm -hmm. rather than for solutions, right? Because it, yeah. like if you spend money on a solution, like, you know, think of like a leaky roof, right? So do you want to, right hire somebody to um basically do a poor job and then and then you know every time it rains you know your your roof starts leaking again uh and then you call up the same person again so he comes back and he patches up again you know uh, doing it in a very poor way and uh and it's of course it's very annoying and every time you spend the money but at a system level um you know, the, the capitalists kind of preferred that way, right? It's like it's better to have, uh, you know, the pet shops, and then, yeah. and then you continuously have demand for it. Um, yeah, and I was thinking again about this, you know, food, medical, yeah. industrial complex. I mean, it, it goes yeah. back to the same concern, right? Where, you know, it, it's it, like you, like if I'm a pharmaceutical company. I don't want people to eat healthy, you know, uh, because because healthy people have no demand for pharmaceutical drugs, oh, right? Well, look at it that way. Yeah. Uh, so in in a way, uh, and that's why I mean, like the food companies that you know basically sell you crap, ultra processed food, uh, to make you know a huge profit because it's a high margin product, um you know, are kind of synergistically with the medical industry uh, that wants to have as many, you know, fat and sick people as possible. Hand and uh, glove relationship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and and then the thing, you know, and this, you know, this might be an argument, uh, the attack on the colleges, I mean, <laughs> on you know, emergency management. No, I mean, I, look, look, I mean, if I was a college admin, yes, I mean, I would yeah. start... Uh, emergency management programs because you know you have more climate yeah. damage and you need to have people who are trained in yeah, yeah. You know, knowing what it's to a, do about it it's a field yeah it's a growing field yeah but i'm just saying like you know it, it would be i mean like look if you're let's say if you're a native american right so if you're completely outside of that you know western you know capitalistic tradition you know you might say or, or object that you know, a better way to deal with climate change is to prevent the emissions in the first place. Uh, then you don't need to create a college program for emergency management, right? Um, and, um, you know, it's kind of applying a precautionary principle. Larry, do you think that there's even a stock market or, or certain stocks 
that people need to look at more closely or I'm not saying that there's certain stocks that, you know, go a certain way, but I can very imagine that if, for instance, there's a high demand for certain kind of products, whenever there is a disaster, let's say like flooding, you know, uh, if somewhat the, the financial market is also entangled, I mean, speculators and, you know, certain stocks that are just uh, being sold or traded. Uh, again, I'm not trying to cook up a conspiracy theory here. And like I, I can very much imagine if there's a demand for certain kinds of things in a disaster, you know, just like you were saying, medical uh, industrial complex, that there's a hand in glove relationship sometimes to getting people obese and then they need medical attention. So, but the same thing, maybe even for certain kinds of stocks that are traded, you know, uh, and private equity, you know, that may have lots of stocks in certain areas, and then it's sort of traded during a crisis or during a disaster. That That's what, for instance, let me give you an example. Like whenever there is a, a hurricane, uh, there is sometimes a spike of gasoline prices. And the conventional argument that people often give is the supply demand, you know. The supply demand is what is causing the the gas prices to go up but what if you know how can we prove that right well then you have to figure out what's the supply you know and if you can quantit quantify it but there are sometimes certain gas stations that refuse to uh, maybe bring it down when everybody else brings it down so when there's this when there's this price gouging going on you know or what if what if someone really is adding a dollar per gallon or something you know <laughs> so that's the thing i'm kind of criticizing i guess there's a financial side you know perhaps when disaster strikes sometimes maybe there's an incentive you know that make things more expensive and like the generators i was talking about those generators get really pricey yeah you know, so i mean so hotel, we've... hotel too by the way hotels <laughs> and neighboring states that have the crisis sometimes there's a jump of the hotel rates because they know that people are desperate to seek lodging and housing. And then you can see a 200% uh, increase of hotel rates. So yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. So if you have like uh, you yeah, know, market-based solutions during a disaster, um, then this is going to be the outcome, right? So, you know, because it's always supply and demand. I mean, right now, okay. Yeah. If the supply of housing is very low, um, then I can jack up the price as a hotel owner. Yeah. So I think the way out of that is um, that, you know, this is what Ulrike Hermann talked about, right? Which is if, if you have like moments of scarcity, then the government has to do the re resource allocation, right? Yeah. Um, because, because the government can basically mandate, um, you know, like a fixed price um, yeah. and you have yeah. to offer it at a fixed price. Now, I mean, obviously, you know, like if you if you do price fixing, I mean, it can make the shortages worse sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, because you know, because if you set the price below the cost of production, right? Then what's going to happen is that, you know, nobody is going to procure the product, right? So the product simply does not exist in the market. Right. Um, and that's why I mean, so. Uh, yeah, I think you were sharing this article about like Argentina and the increase in the poverty rate, which is very oh, yeah, serious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then there was this other law which uh, Millet passed, which was about uh, deregulating the the rental prices, oh. uh, which resulted in an increase in the rent. Uh, but then, hmm. but then after that, the 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 rent started to come down because you you, you had more and more um, available houses, I guess. Yeah, landlords who are like, hey, you know, now I can charge as much as I want, so I can um, offer, you know, my my housing space. Uh, and because you had so many people that were offering the housing space, who had like open housing spaces, uh, and then that gradually then gives a signal to the market, and you know, the prices start coming down actually. Okay. Um. And. Yeah. So, so for me, it's like okay. So, what's the housing solution? I mean, it's not the rent controls, in my view. Okay. I, I, I think that again, the most progressive way of lowering the house prices uh, is to increase the supply. 
And so what you could, there's there's two things you can do. I mean, one you can um loosen the zoning restrictions, which means that you allow for high density build areas in the downtown areas. Uh and uh and and in that way you attract private capital to uh, to invest in the higher density housing, which you can for which you can charge lower rents now, right? Um and secondly, uh, you could have public house building programs that are starting to compete directly with the private sector housing. This is what they're doing in Vienna. Yeah. Uh, this is a policy that's been going on for over 100 years, and I think it's very effective yeah. uh, to, to, to regulate so, rent prices. Public and private development of housing, right? That they are competing more, but you still have a public housing uh, develop, development and, or social housing, and then you have a private uh, housing development as well yes Something yes like um okay. and and of course i mean the, the right-wing argument in the u.s is that you know the government is not capable of doing anything um yeah. we are which is quite ironic because if you go back to so the book that i had uh appear in a night counter the uh, palo alto by malcolm harris um and he describes you know how the bay area which is the home of stanford university you know, the home of uh, most Berkeley. of the technology yeah. uh, companies. Yeah, UC Berkeley, but uh, Caltech uh, and many of the technology companies in the, around Silicon Valley. Um, and yeah, I mean, of course, the important thing was the university, but then, uh, which was endowed by Leland Stanford, um, who made a lot of money off of, I think, um, uh, mineral mining in, in, in California. And also building the railroads using Chinese labor, um, and um, yeah, so the, the it, it was the military, the military industrial complex. Um, so, especially after fighting World War II, right? Um, and the United States um, government made the choice to not deinvest in the military, right? To keep military spending elevated, and so then all of these. You know, military uh, DOD contracts were going to the labs in Stanford, um, in Caltech, um, and then ultimately um, into um, um, you know also companies. Well, at first it was the defense companies, but then there would be a spillover effect uh, where you know companies like Apple or Microsoft started to benefit from these uh, um, military investments. Uh, in technologies, um, like a military Keynesianism effect or something, like a Keynesian spillover. That's right. Yeah. So when people are saying, "Well, the government cannot do anything," I mean, well, so the government in this case, I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't the civil servants who were doing the research, right? Mm -hmm. So you still had the researchers at Stanford, at Caltech, um, Berkeley, and uh, and then later uh, also the industry researchers, right? So they were doing, so they were kind of the human capital that was uh, critical to develop these industries. Yeah. Um, but you needed to have an institution like the government that was willing to take the risk mm -hmm. to, yeah. yeah, to invest in, you know, hey, let's uh, invest in these semiconductors. I mean, now semiconductors are quite ubiquitous and they are uh crucial aspect of the AI revolution. Uh, if you look at the NVIDIA stock, which is booming right now. Um, but back then, it was a new thing, right? Um, Help me remember the Italian economist that you're, I think you're, ah, capitalist status. Uh, the uh, the state as a kind of investment, uh, the Italian economist. We talked about- Mazzucato. Yeah, I could never pronounce her last name. So Mariana Mazzucato, that, yeah. yeah. Mariana Mazzucato, did I pr pronounce it right? Yeah, yeah. yeah she teaches at uh, LSE, I yeah. want to say. or Yeah, okay, uh, so this is a, a main thesis that she also has, that the, the state has capital, and the state is an actor in this regard that they can, and it makes investments. So it's not just a pure free market, you know, thing that the state has money and investments that it can steer the economy and, uh, intervene when necessary. Yeah, Is that kind yeah. Of and if, if if you remember, uh, so Mazzucato and then also yeah. uh, Peter Evans, uh, who you know, uh, I think the developmental state, and he really developed that concept back in the nineties. Okay. Um, and he kind of pushes the argument: you're bringing the state back in, 
um, yeah. uh, and, and you know, doing very good historical sociology, uh, basically comparing these um, uh, cases of uh, techno development uh, through the state. Um, and the most successful example of that was South Korea, in his view, uh, then Brazil to some extent as well. Um, yeah, and so uh, there have been um, countries that, um, I mean, he coined the term embedded autonomy. Um, okay. And I think the, the idea is that, um, so you needed to have, the private actors that have sufficient amount of autonomy from the state that, you know, they wouldn't be um, completely controlled by the state. Uh, but then they, they were still embedded within the state to some extent, right? Uh, uh, there was still like active interchange between uh, the developmental agencies of the government and the, um, the R&D department of a company, for instance, right? Okay. Uh, so there would be communication between them, um, and uh, and oftentimes working in a synergistic way, um, because you know th because the state is helping uh, those uh, companies along a trajectory of um, you know yeah. uh, like I don't know lowering export controls for instance right so it's easier for them to get export licenses so they can export the products into other countries, right? Or receiving so a, extra tax credits, right? A contemporary example would be someone like SpaceX. Like SpaceX would be an example of, you know, it's it's private, but yet the state kind of gives or gives, you know, contracts to a private company. Or, I mean, even the beginning of Tesla, Tesla was kind of, uh, I mean, it had a lot of tax uh uh, reduction the so it's a kind of it's state also kind of becomes involved a little bit in giving in incentives and investment but it, it's an, an autonomous actor i mean yeah would that be fair to say i think of like uh yeah so some so, company yeah Tesla so space x um yeah. yeah so they they did receive significant subsidies right uh from the yeah. state um okay. because i mean quite frankly i mean there's no private actor that wants to spend money on space travel uh quite frankly right um yeah, yeah, yeah. um and versus i think because the u.s government through nasa uh still has that legacy of basically wanting to um take over the space uh, outer space uh, and that was in response to the soviet union right because yeah. you know because Before. the americans saw like you know, um, Yuri Gagarin, right, going out in space, and then, and then the Americans kind of Sputnik, Sputnik, um, yeah, Sputnik, yeah. Uh, and then the Americans kind of felt the pressure that they had to do the same thing, they had to do their own moon landing and stuff, uh, and recently I think there was a movie about, um, you know, the the oh, you know, what if the moon landing was faked, you know, that that sort of uh, oh. uh, thing, but um, yeah. but yeah, so 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 so, so the the, so the government. Um, you know, as part of this whole military industrial complex, I mean, this whole idea of like, we've got to beat the Soviet Union, right? Um, I, I, I think they have this legacy of like, you know, let's make these big investments, you know, let's try things out, you know, and, and, and see whether it has, uh, whether it makes a splash, you know, whether, you know, we can actually uh, generate new technologies that are um, general purpose that, you know, people can use. Um, and in that sense, yes, I think that 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 the American um, system um, is um, is working the most optimally uh, to to achieve that uh, objective. Um, and um, yeah, so so yeah, I, I think innovation, I think is is always something that you know. That did we find is is good uh, for us, yeah. right? Um, because you know it makes our lives better for sure. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so not 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 everything about civilization is bad, right? Um, no, I'm not. No. I mean, I'm not sure whether people want to completely abandon, you know, uh, 
like civilization advances, right? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. You made a good point. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But, Yeah. but again, you know, it's, it's, it's but then Oh, you, you're, you're turning more philosophical on me now. <laughs> I have to think of how I'm going to respond. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but, but the issue is, I mean, it's always like, so everything that we gain is always comes at a cost every time. Right. So when we're saying, well, you know, we want to live a good life, which means that we want to burn as much energy as possible because, Because, you know, what does it mean to have a good life? I mean, to have a good life means that, 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 that in order to get the things that we find are comfortable and convenient, you know, we have to put in less and less effort in order to obtain uh, those goods, right? Um, and, um, Well, I, yeah, and, yeah. and, 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 and so you have to burn a significant amount of energy and... Um, I, well, it's like it's like the invention of the automobile. I mean, the automobile produced leisure, and we know that our whole society changed around the automobile, particularly in the West. Drive-throughs, highways, go from the suburbs. It even reconstructed our communities, but it's a manufactured risk. I mean. Even with the EV car, it does, like you said, it has consequences. The vehicle, the automobile requires a highway. That means we're making room. We're destroying eco-habitat. It changes the landscape. It means that we're, we're wasting more energy to go from point A to point B. Our cities get wider, and there's not enough space to put, put the damn cars everywhere, right? So, you know, you know how it is in big cities, probably where you live, but... Uh, the automobile starts to take up too much space and uh, all these things start to accumulate all these risks to, to maintain it, to, to build roads for it, to, you know, all the things that are made to produce it, the, the toxic things. And well, we could have just had a little, you know, two wheeler bicycle and we could have rode around in a little village in, in, in Austria or Germany. No problem. Right. We could have done that too. But no, we had to have automobiles, uh, and now we have them. And until we get rid of them, <laughs> things will always uh, be chaotic. Even with EVs, I think even uh, electron, like, you know, with charging stations and all this, uh, and it's still going to have an effect, I think, on our lifestyles, uh, our health, whether people are mobile, or whether. They're walking enough a day, or they are just in their cars all day. Um, and that, that's something I've noticed. I don't know about you, but in the U.S., it seems that people spend hours in their cars commuting, and then go to the restaurant, and right. So it's a it's a real health risk too to our uh, lifestyle. But then again, it's also ecological problems. I don't know. I'm going off here, but <laughs> yeah, a little so off topic. I mean, yesterday I went to the Baltimore Symphony, uh, you know, orchestra, and you know, because I like to listen to you know, classical music, you know, live performance every once in a while, and um, uh, and uh, you know, whenever the performance is finished, so I always buy the seat that's closest to the exit, and so the performance is finished, everybody. gets up and claps and that's when i storm out Mm -hmm. uh, of the uh of the orchestra and um and i'm try to be one of the first people to escape to the to, to get to the parking deck um because you because you park so it's a um parking garage uh and oftentimes if you come a little bit later then you have to go up to the third or the fourth floor uh right to find parking So um yeah if you, if if you go with the rush right like when everybody is going to the parking deck Three hours uh, to get out, huh? then yeah it's going to be very hard to get out um <laughs> right. you're going to it's it's like a really long long line to kind of get out of it so if you do, don't want to wait you either have to be one of the first people um to get in the parking deck uh or one of the last people which means you know you wait more than half an hour after the performance Uh, and that's that's what I also used to do. I mean, you know, I would just like walk around downtown area for you know half an hour, and then I would go go back and you know, and and, and then see that everybody is cleared out at that point, right? Um, Yeah, it, so yeah, it's definitely very, very massive. Uh, 
you know, in Dallas, Metroplex, where I live, uh, it's uh, the attempt was made to just keep adding another lane. You know, 635 is one example. It's a major highway. They have, I think, five or four lanes. And uh, the, the thought was, we could fix this problem. We'll just add another lane. You know, we add another lane. <laughs> But there's so many cars, and if, if a household has three to four cars, you can just imagine that there's more cars than there's space available. And even in a big place like Texas, where you think there's an enormous amount of space, the cities can't handle it. And there's all sorts of problems. Like, you know, I can make a long list, but there's car accidents, there's, there's noise pollution, there's air pollution. There's a problem of where you put them. Uh, there's, you know, all sorts of problems with too many cars. And I don't think, I don't know what, what will take, but even the attempt to try to introduce public transportation is, is often too late because then you have to really force people into public transportation. They're not going to do it voluntarily. So, uh, yeah, it's a big thing with big cities. I can only imagine in LA, I, I don't know how they do it in LA, but if, yeah, if it's if it's you know not regulated or nothing done about it, then there you have more cars and you have more people, and and the list of problems goes on. And yeah, and every time I do fly to Europe, I always make them compare contrast. At least they have infrastructure that they could don't have to have a car. You know, if you're a student, you don't have to have a car. You can ride your bicycle, but uh, it seems like. In some places, it may be difficult to just avoid a car because you have no other option. Like if you live in Arizona in the heat, I don't know how you can do it without AC conditioned car. Uh, in Texas too, I mean, it gets so hot that it's it's people that try to do that have heat strokes, you know. But some people try to live very close to the stores, and then they think if they can maybe, you know, walk at night and get groceries and just uh, but the distance, the distance is always, often a problem. What I have observed. Yeah, um, the distance is is, is huge. Uh, but Ridiculous, again, yeah. um, I, I mean, you know, for the public transportation that we have, I know in Baltimore, right? Uh, yeah. it, it just is, is not. It's it's not story? reliable. I mean, because because okay. you know, I would have to go really far. Yeah. Uh, I would have to walk half an hour to the bus stop. Um, oh wow. Yeah, and then and then the bus ride itself probably is like you know fifteen minutes or so. Yeah, and then and then the bus would drop me off like, you know, three blocks maybe from the uh, university. You still, to, you still have to walk. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically the commute time would be about an hour, I would say. Oh wow! Yeah, um, that's ridiculous. And then when I drive, it's about twelve minutes, right? So. What about e-bikes? Are e bikes popular where you live e-bikes people have the little e-bikes you know the... yeah but then where would i ride it i mean i could ride yeah. it on the big street you know with you know with, with okay. like a like big two-lane street um you know which isn't doesn't sound very safe to me uh or i could ride on uh on the sidewalk you're saying it's uh, you're saying it's unsafe right <laughs> Is it you think it's a an american problem like where this idea i don't know where it's coming from but that somehow people on bicycles are kind of an easy target. I mean, that it's, there's no, I mean, obviously if, if you if you run over a, or you hit, hit a bicyclist, you're in big trouble. But my impression has been, I mean, I don't know, maybe I've lived here too many years that uh, there's not enough protection for bicycle riders, uh, especially in commuter areas. And they don't have sometimes pavements. There are some cities that try. They try to have a bicycle lane, you know. They just uh, allocate that space for the bicyclist. But uh, it's at risk sometimes as a, as a bicyclist to to you're taking a risk, you know, because the cars can hit you. And yeah, and, there's this idea uh, that like you know, if if you if you build it, they will come. That is to say, if you yeah. build the bike roads, then more people are going to ride the bike. Yeah. And I in, in my take actually is that. I, th I think you have to fix the city design first, right? Yeah. Um, you know, where I think in, in America, there's so much, uh, especially among middle-class people, right? People who are able to afford their own home uh, are able to take out a mortgage. 
um, they oftentimes will do so, right? At significant cost uh, to, you know, um, uh, like mortgage payments and stuff. Um, because there is so much suspicion of strangers, right? So there, there's this idea that, well, okay, if I, you know, lived in a, in a large apartment building with um, strangers, uh, you know, they might be throwing parties, they might be drug addicts or, you know, whatever. I mean, there's so much suspicion uh, against uh, strangers that people are saying, well, I want to live in these uh, in these houses. Yeah, suburbs, um, <laughs> yeah, and then the suburbs, yeah, and then the suburbs distances are going to be huge, yeah. right? Um, I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it's everything is going to be a short drive away for sure. Uh, you know, it takes you five minutes to drive to the grocery store, but you know, a five minute drive is still, you know, uh, like half an hour walk or you know, 20 yeah. minute bike ride or something. I don't know. Um, so, uh, it, 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 it just is not made convenient um and that's why i think that uh putting up the bike lanes is insufficient actually you know okay yeah i i think you need the secondary measure which is to convince the people that that european style density is actually positive right yeah um and and then that's something that like look i mean in, in america we don't really face the problem i mean unless you are in new york city um, because you know, in Manhattan, I think you know real estate is is very scarce. Uh, but in most other parts of the country, um, you know, real estate is not scarce. Uh, I mean, in you in your area, I mean, in yeah. Dallas, let's say, I mean, you know, you could have you know significant expansion, right? Um, so I mean, oh, yeah. um, you know, p people can continuously. Uh, you know, expand their uh, you know, th their location, right? Um, yeah, you know, it's definitely it, it's a big massive. place. It's it's a massive place. Um, the only limitations I see is ecological limitations with water resources, and much of the south is is going to be impacted with limited water resources. And they're even saying this now with uh, Texas. Uh, you know, has the larger agricultural sector. And I think even the uh, uh, agriculture commissioner of Texas, he uh, said something about that this is going to be a with global warming, you know, and water resources are becoming scarcer in the in the state of Texas. And so, yeah, this that's the only limitation is they have population growth, but they'll have ecological uh, water resource restrictions and and uh also the all the food i mean yeah the, they get it all trucked in uh texas really doesn't have its own let's say it has agriculture but not enough for it to sustain itself i mean it has to have uh, uh, it coming in from the outside you know so uh so yeah that's the only restriction there's enough land there's enough real estate if it's property utilized and if it's you know zoned correctly uh, so that's the only other issue that I can notice is the zoning. Zoning uh, becomes a, an issue of how people decide to develop the, the cities and if they have restrictions on commercial development, it makes uh, residential development, or if they don't balance it, then it's there's a problem. And I think that's in, in any American city. If, if they don't try to balance it to, to where you have residential development taking a priority, or you want uh, commercial development to have an edge because of money, you know? And see yeah, so money. yeah, the American so, idea of like commercial development is yeah. uh, is basically strip malls, right? For the most part. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, it it it, it, it retail. Yeah, Costco. I mean, <laughs> it's not really um, kind of like a walkable pedestrian zone. Uh, in a downtown area, uh, you know, right. there's very few superbly nice downtown areas where people really want to walk. And I think if you want to have that kind of environment, I believe that you need to have um, like mixed development or something. Yeah, yeah we, a mixed development. So, and you need to go up high enough. So, if you say. Yeah. Yeah, in the average European city, if you have like let's say a six-story building, right, 
And the first floor is going to be the shops. And the second floor and above is residential. Oh, yeah. That's how they do it in Vienna, I think, right? Yeah. In, so in, I, in, I, in town, yeah. Yeah, that's a good arrangement. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, imagine, let's say, in my let's say in my apartment building, if I lived in one of those, right? Mm -hmm. If there was a cafe that was downstairs. Oh, wow. You know, you, you can bet I would spend a significant amount of time the money there. In, 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 that, in that cafe, right? Uh, what do you just... get the, the Vienna? The, they have the nice bakery items and bread and the salami and the, what do you call it? Good to tasty Austrian food, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like you can have the sausages, and then and then nearby. I mean, if you walk half a block, you might get a kebab shop, right? Uh -huh. uh, it's kind of is 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 is. I'm missing the most. Oh, you're good. Audio. I hear your uh, audio. That's okay. All right. right. Uh, the, the the audio was. Yeah, it's okay. No uh, not back here. I don't know why. It's all right. That's. <laughs> Yeah, so you, uh, yeah, we we're talking about Austria, Vienna. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and uh, okay. Um, you know, now I can hear you. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure whether that. Uh, oh, just uh, microphone. Yep, the microphone has been turned back on. Yeah, it's it it's it, it's kind of a loose connection, probably. That's that's probably what. I had the same problem with mine. Uh, when I use these speakers, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it can sometimes. Okay. Happen. Um, but yeah, so you know, in Vienna, yeah, I mean, you can have you know very, um, you know, the good food availability, right? Um, and that's kind of what yeah. you're missing. I mean, in in the in, in the Baltimore area, um, you know. There are like few good restaurants here and there, um, but, uh, but but not, not not so much. So you know, oftentimes I just go to the supermarket, buy your stuff and make it. Yeah, I just, I just buy everything myself. You know, I just buy the ingredients myself, and uh, and then you can yeah. have uh, you know generally good food. I mean, but I, I so I went to the Aldi this time uh, instead of going to oh, the yeah. Giant. I go there um, often. We have one here too. Yeah, so I can buy like the the, the German bratwurst, like the sausages and stuff, mm -hmm. um, and and even like you know buying like tons of like steak and, um, and like you know uh, pork shoulder and things like that, and um, and I was and I probably spent like thirty dollars less than I would at uh, at another grocery store, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a good little store. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's just like the issue is like give me like when I, when I buy like the strawberries, I mean they were not completely fresh. I mean they were still edible, uh, <laughs> but they you know but you can see that they've been stored there for a long time, right? Um, uh, but but the meats are, are great, uh, so it's a good selection there. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and they, they have also so many cheeses too, right? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah. The Germans are very much. They're into cheeses and sausages, right? Uh, they do a very good job with that. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I, I guess there's so much similarity, even with Austrian diet, uh, the sausage and the the milk and the cheeses and the and then you get the sauerkraut. Yeah, names. The names are similar uh, for some of the recipes. Uh, I guess it's just the German language or something. The similarities with the uh, the types of dishes they have and. The Wiener Schnitzel, yeah, <laughs> the big Schnitzel. So yeah, which, which which they're selling over there as well, right? So they they're, they're yeah. selling the yeah selling the Schnitzel uh, as well. Yeah. So you know, I I always like you know uh, to well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, but 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 for that stuff, I mean, I would usually wait to go back to Vienna and then I would probably eat it there. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure where authentic stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how much of a good quality you're gonna be able to get over here. Uh, they they had they had these German restaurants in, mm. uh, I think in, uh, Ronhurst. It was it was one of the neighborhoods in Philadelphia, right? Uh, where you know many of the German Americans were, uh, and they and they had this restaurant which was called Austrian Village. Oh really? Um, yeah, and uh, Ronhurst, yeah, that neighborhood. 
Fox I'll Chase. Check that out yeah. One day. yeah, yeah. Uh so uh yeah, and I would yeah, I went there a few times and it, it, but but the but the schnitzel was a little bit thicker than they would do it uh in, in Vienna. Yeah. Uh yeah. In Vienna they would usually they, they would take the hammer and then they would make Oh it yeah, yeah. My mom does flat. that still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my mom uh, still beats it with the, the yeah the yeah yeah you have to beat it like very very thin i mean you, you have to cut it thin and then you have to beat it thin right uh, so yeah. it cooks a lot faster that way too i think the fries it yeah. cooks a lot faster and then basically i mean you, you want more of the crunch really right it, yeah. it's really it's, it's it, the it, fries. <laughs> yeah the, the secret is, is is a crunch of the breading right and then you have yeah. a little bit of the of the meat right yeah. Um Good and stuff. uh yeah if you if you have let's say like you know really thick meat you know you're probably gonna have yeah. the trouble um uh you know with with, with that um okay. yeah, yeah um okay any, any other thing that should be addressed well I mean obviously you know yeah. uh you know we have I mean the Austrian election is tomorrow but we'll find out know, what happens yeah maybe yeah. we'll have a post election discussion like in a week or so from now and we'll see if our predictions go the way we think well, we, haven't, we, we haven't made any we haven't made any oh we haven't what's your prediction is uh the spu are going to uh uh make the chancellor i mean who, who's the guy bubbler bubbler yeah Bubbler. yeah yeah well is he's he, he... is he looking good in the in the uh prediction or is he going to be just tied with the ufb do you know? Yeah, uh, um, I, the I mean I don't know. I, I'm trying to remember. I, I know they were predicting that FPÖ is going to have the same effect like the AFD in Germany because of this uh, right wing kind of movement uh, with the voters. But I'm curious about Austria. I don't know uh, what impact it will have on the Greens in Germany. The Greens were were severely impacted negatively uh but I, I don't well know the greens they're... are very yeah. low right now i think they're like less than 10 yeah. percent um yeah. uh the spo is at about 20 percent a little bit more yeah. than 20 percent the neos um the neos, is the, kind of... the, 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 the neos are doing quite well i think there's it's about 10 percent, i would say and then uh and then the and then the two largest parties are ovp and fpo and they have about 25 percent a piece, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think twenty five percent FPO and then twenty four percent for OVP, which means that it can go either way. It can be a grand um, coalition, maybe. Will that, that happen? No, a coalition. Uh, well, it might Probably not be a... enough. I mean, it might not be enough for two oh, parties. Okay. Hmm. Uh, well, with the exception of OVP FPO, I think that that coalition will definitely work. So FPO might, you know, if they become first and they get the chancellorship. And then Nehama from the OVP is going to be vice chancellor. Or it's going to be the other way around, right? If the OVP becomes the biggest party. It'd be the uh, guy, that one guy, that, that populist? Well, if OVP What's becomes number again? one. I can never pronounce his name. Bikla? What is it? Mikla? I hope I pronounce it right. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Which party? FP, the FPU, the guy that is... Uh, Kekel. Kickle, okay, Kickle. Yeah, Kickle is the guy in charge. Um Okay. And but he would, uh, he, would, he wouldn't take over the chancellorship if he if his party wins. Uh well well he he would have the he would he would be able to claim it, right? Okay. But he okay. Oh okay. Um But you do you remember last time, so uh when the okay. uh, F so OVP FPO they went into a government twenty uh 2017 i want to say um uh, and uh the the president at that time was from the green party uh van der bellen uh and van, and, yeah, yeah, and, and van der bellen he said that he was not going to appoint uh so-called right-wing extremists right so there, there were a few people within the fpo party right johan gudenos uh, who was uh caught with like you know the hitler greeting right um, you know, he did not want to appoint him as a minister, and so he wasn't, right? Uh, he became the chairman of the parliamentary committee, right? Um, and um, yeah, so I, I, I believe so right now, because obviously, you know, Van der Bellen is still the president, so he might do the same thing again, right? Uh, it might be, um, 
you know, uh, not wanting to appoint certain uh, FPO ministers. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, it's still the will of the people. I mean, you know, if yeah. FPO does get like more than 25%, uh, and if they become number one, then they will claim the chancellorship for sure. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I've, seats, yeah, yeah I, I wish that the SPU was going to do better. Um, but right now, I mean, 2021%, um, you know, he does a very good social media game, right? And Facebook and Twitter and stuff. Uh, but, um, but the message is not, you know, so, so resonant at this point, I would say. Okay. Um, yeah, he has a very good ground game, like, uh, going into the constituencies, uh, going into you know the countryside uh, to meet people and you know uh, party events um, and giving speeches, um, but uh, but it but it doesn't look like he's gonna be number one, right? Um, uh, okay. and, and like so, his entire program was about like. You know, Green New Deal and um, like investing in yeah. uh, public sector pro, jobs and things like that, right? Pro pro labor union, trade union, yeah. Yeah, very much pro trade union and okay. very confrontational with uh, the business federations, the business interests. Yeah. Um, I, very confrontational I, with the right wing, with uh, with the yeah. FPO. Yeah, I saw some of the quote. He 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 wants to stick the taxes on the rich. Yeah, I saw that. So it's a kind of Bernie Sanders in Austria, no? <laughs> he's a kind of, yeah, uh, yeah, he is. He's, 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 he's a so, he's a socialist, so yeah. He, yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. A, yeah, a young, yeah. a young, younger one, right? He's in his fifties. Yeah, he's in his fifties. Yeah, early fifties. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens, uh, Larry. I don't know. Uh, elections are sometimes predictable or unpredictable, but for what I've seen in Germany, it seems to uh, just bolden the the populists. I don't know. They usually get they had higher in uh Turingen and in uh Sachsen Anhalt, I think. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll Turing see what happens. And, and and Sachsen, yeah. Yeah, Sachsen. Um yeah. yeah, so yeah, so they did very well in those provinces and um it yeah. those are like East German provinces and uh they always feel like they're you know neglected Victims. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, by the political institutions, right? Um, uh, and uh, you yeah, know, there might be something to it, right? Uh, you know, yeah, this yeah. relative deprivation versus like you know, West Germany, um, and also it's like the German Appalachians, Appalachian, Appalachia, Appalachia. Yeah, and also there's like the sense that like okay, we're wasting all this money on the Ukraine war. Uh, we, you know, we should take care of our own kind. Uh, there's some kind of uh, respect, fear of, of of Putin, right? Um, mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah, it's and 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 they and and they want to look at kind of really the short term benefits really uh, of. Basically, you know, what happens if you cut off Ukraine? I mean, are you going to be able to redirect more resources uh, to to care for your own? Uh, but 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 that doesn't make any sense to me at all, in my view, because, you know, if, if you let Putin win, then, then you know, yeah, the defense... You're going, more, you're going to have more refugees. <laughs> yeah, you have more refugees. The defense spending is going to go up, right? So yeah. you're going to cut more resources... You know, away from you know whatever social budget that you thought that the government was going to spend it on, right? Um, so there's going to be harder times ahead, anyways. Uh, so I would say that the cost is still relatively less uh, if uh, you, you know if if Ukraine is still standing and is able to fight back against Russia. Um, yeah, I, I I wish it was like simply okay. This was only a civil war between you know the post soviet states right um but this that's not my impression i mean i i think this this disaster is going to keep rolling on um and we're going to see much more of that stuff um you know, if, if yeah if the russians win it um uh and also i mean th th there's so much uh, uncertainty right now in the middle east as well right 
Lebanon. Yeah, Lebanon, right? You have the Hezbollah chief who was uh, Hassan Nasrallah, who was being assassinated. Yeah, what about Iran's his... gonna uh, uh, respond? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, they haven't responded to to the Hamas incident, so where uh, Haniya, the the Hamas leader, was assassinated in Tehran. Um, yeah, I mean, you would think, well, I mean, this is supposed to be a safe space if you are in a, you know, uh, if if you're a high dignitary visiting another country, right? Um, and uh, and clearly, I mean, the Mossad, uh, the Israeli intelligence agencies, have connections to. The highest levels of the Iranian state, to be quite frank, because uh, that's how they receive this kind of information. Uh, that's how they also know where the Hezbollah, Hezbollah leader was uh, was hiding. That's how they were able to rig these uh, walkie talkies and pagers. Oh, that was crazy! Um, that then exploded. That's that's a twenty first century warfare. Can you imagine? You can weaponize the. Uh, was it now? Was it because it was put in there? Or was really something technical where you can blow it up? No, no, it, 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 the explosives was put into the device itself. Oh, okay. So and, I had the, yeah. So now I understand. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, what happened was that um, there, there was a consignment of those walkie-talkies that uh, that Hezbollah has ordered uh, because because they knew that the, the the Mossad was able to track. Um, the cell phone usage uh, of those uh, Hezbollah fighters. Right. And so they thought, okay, well, we're going to order the walkie-talkies, but then when they were putting in the order, um, the, you know, the Mossad was listening in uh, and they basically inter intercepted that right. consignment uh, and then they uh, they tampered with it, so they uh, added the explosives Oh, um no. and then they you know uh put that forward the shipment it. uh and then it was distributed um and then once all of these walkie talkies were distributed then they started to explode right yeah um, that was all over the news a couple a week ago i guess yeah okay for me what were they, why is it terrifying well it's because because okay so once anybody uses the technology right it will yeah be yeah. It 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 can be used again and again, right? Yeah. Uh, by many many different actors. Um. And uh, so right now, like, should I feel ever safe? Like, if I walk around with my cell phone, I mean, is it, you know, can somebody rig it in a way? I mean, if I said something that somebody didn't like, and then he's like, "Well, I gotta kill this guy," and then you know, I'm gonna tamper with his phone, and then. And then it's gonna, uh, uh, you know, explode on him while he's going, you know, driving to work or something, right? Um, it's a know, possibility, I, yeah, in the future, yeah. Yeah, I mean, right now you're like, okay, well, that's we paranoia, drones. but uh, we already got drones, so yeah. Yeah, and the drone warfare. I mean, well, because of the Ukraine war, I mean, uh, the technical advances that are happening with drones are happening by leaps and bounds, right? Um, the big decision that's happening, and it hasn't been made yet, is whether to have fully autonomous drones. Uh, do you allow uh, drones uh, to autonomously make the decision uh, to, um, to, to, to kill people? Um, because right now we still leave that in the hands of people, right? You know, people yeah. are steering the drones. The operators, yeah. Yeah, the operators. But uh, but yeah. I would think that you know, it, like there there is there there is a gen general risk, right? That um, because oftentimes in the warfare, I mean, the people that you know uh, win the battle are the ones that. Yeah. Um, you know, act the fastest and and yes i mean it's going to be uh okay. it, 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 it's going to be um uh much faster uh if you um you know have uh you could say the the machines that are uh making those decisions right
Um, those kill decisions that's right yeah um so so that that's generally you know a, a risk that has to be um considered for sure um and um yeah i mean it's uh so, so you know the, the future of warfare i think is, is is definitely um you know in uncharted territories um yeah i uh, i have Maybe one question: Do you think you think Putin will really do it? Like you know, as far as uh, using nuclear weapons against Ukraine, you think he really will? I mean, I'm, I'm not throwing it out there, but he always makes a threat that he's going to do it. Uh, he, uh, I think he said if um, Russia gets attacked or something, or or the neighboring ally, uh, that he could use the nuclear weapon in response. I think Putin said that. I think he would actually do something like that to risk it, you know, like um, use nuclear. I, I, or that's that so I'm not trying to ask you that, but I'm curious. Yeah, <laughs> so I mean, nobody can read Putin's mind, uh, but from so what serious? I understand right now, um, I I I think he he's only going to do it if he feels that he's threatened himself, right? Okay. So clearly, I mean, when Ukraine attacked. The Korsk Oblast, uh, the bordering region. Um, you know, he didn't feel personally threatened, and so that's why, you know, he thought that the, okay, this was just an anti-terrorism operation, right? What's happening in Korsk Oblast, right? right. Okay. Even though, I mean, clearly, I mean, this was an, a military incursion, and you know, the Russians lost, you know, some land, right? Yeah. Um, but. Uh, and remember, at the beginning of the war, he was saying that anybody who is threatening the territorial integrity of Russia anywhere uh, is going to have to face the nuclear weapons of Russia. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so he's bluffing. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, he's bluffing. And so, okay, right now there's like a final bluff, right, that he has, right, which is he's saying that he's going to use the nukes if Biden gives the permission to used uh, uh, American uh, long-range weapons to strike inside of Russia, right? Oh. Um, and right now, it looks to me like Biden is caving to, um, to, to, to Putin's position, right? And I think it's a mistake. Um, you know, I, uh, appeasement? I, something like appeasement or something? Yeah, well, yeah, because because then it's like, well, okay, if Putin will then get away with it uh, to basically have his military supplies being safe, and he can fight as long as he wants to in this war, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I I I think that you know I think the U.S. should send a signal to Russia that that you know that we that we will do everything to make sure that Ukraine wins in this war. And I think that, you know, one of the ways to do that is to uh, allow for these long range striking capabilities. Um, and if you completely throw the military logistics behind the lines in Russia into turmoil, uh, it will stop their ability to, uh, uh, to, to fight this war effectively in the way how they wanted it to. Um, and so I, so I would be, very strongly um, in favor of lifting those restrictions. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, we, we would. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, could could he escalate it further? Well, I mean, there's only one point of escalation that's possible, to be quite frank, right? Which is, I mean, he he, you know, he could use, um, you know, the nuclear weapons, right? Um, tactical nuclear weapons against uh, Ukraine. Yeah. Um yeah but I mean but if he if he does that then then the west must respond in some manner right you think NATO um, NATO could get involved then really that would step the that would be the overstepping of the the red line whatever red line there is i guess <laughs> yeah that's right i mean you know like if 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 NATO for instance sends in the air force right um well and then and then Putin has to decide. I mean, does he want to destroy the entire planet mm. so that he can finally get Ukraine under his control? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, yes. I mean, it, look, it's it is going to be a high risk operation, um, to the entire world. Um, but again, I, I, so my take is that, you know, I don't think he's going to use it unless he himself feels he feel threatened. threatened. Okay. Um, and look, I mean, there's going to be no country that will invade Russia. Well, I mean, that's like a hundred percent sure, right? Because, um, because of the nukes, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you have to said like the. Like the entire border between, let's say, Russia and Finland, right? Finland is now a NATO border, right? Is is effectively unguarded by Russia yeah. because they have to obviously move those troops into Ukraine, right? Um, and there never is any threat by NATO or by Finland to attack Russia, right? Um, so clearly, I mean. Yeah, so I I don't think that even like Putin thinks that he himself is being endangered in Moscow, right? Um, so, uh, so I think this whole nuclear weapons game, I think it's it, it, it's, it's a bluff. A bluff. Huh? Okay, um, well, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We never we we won't know, you know, until it, something like that, that really happens. Well, the thing I'm worried yep. about is a mistake or accident or something like. You know, that is used accidentally. Yeah, and then the other concern that we have is, uh, you know, what is the outcome of the U.S. election, right? I think, yeah, yeah. That that's going to be geopolitically more interesting than what's happening in Austria or. In, in we'll have Germany. to wait until November. We'll have another podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. Um, it's right. just everything is unknown. Uh, everything is up in the air. Um. Um, yeah, I see polls here and there, right, swinging in the direction, and uh, I have a hard time firmly believing in any polls, to be quite frank. Okay. Um, so my take is that um, that they, they can go either way, and uh, you know that um, uh, yeah, they did. I I I think the biggest difference is going to be on the geopolitics front. Uh, I also think that in terms of like this whole like fiscal responsibility thing, I think that Trump is going to be worse uh, on the fiscal side of things. I think the deficits is going to increase because he's going to give all of these tax breaks to rich people, right? Um, he's going to recoup some money back. Uh, through through the tariffs on the imports, yeah. Um, but then basically, what it means is that like everything for you and me is going to become more expensive, right? So we'll, we'll probably be out get... of a job by then. We'll be out of a job. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and you and I, I mean, like you know, we are or the intellectuals. We have to leave. We have to. We will not have jobs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we university scholars. I mean, we're all globalists, right? Yeah. Uh, because you know, because global. we need. Yeah, because we need foreign students, we need foreign enrollment, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, if that if that enrollment is not there, you know, you're gonna have a very hard time operating those universities. Yeah. Um. So, so so I think we we have an interest to. Uh, had to basically go against the grain of uh of, of kind of the popular sentiment, which is to yeah. increase deportations of particularly undocumented migrants. Um and uh and, and also like you remember last time when Trump was in charge, right? You had Betsy DeVos, right? <laughs> you had the kind of like oh, yeah. private for profit education system, right? That yeah. was being promoted and supported by the government. Um and uh yeah so so like Trump University, right? Uh, which itself went bankrupt, I suppose. Uh, but 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 those kinds of educational institutions, um, like low quality educational institutions, they probably will thrive under this administration. Yeah. Um. And then the big concern is like you know is he going to, um, like want to change the institutions right? Like you know, re reduce the accountability of the presidency, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, an authoritarian turn. You mean? Like yeah, the, uh, change out the civil servants so that they 
you know, work yeah. for him directly instead of, you know, being a Weberian bureaucracy, right? Loyalty pledges. <laughs> yeah, making loyalty <laughs> pledges effectively. And uh, now, okay, so the only good news that I see, in my view, is that he wasn't able to do it during his first term, which suggests to me that there's a deeper level of incompetence um, that he has. So he's very good with like ego, charisma, right? Like he has the Proud Boys on the side. Um, he has the core voter base on the side. Um, but he wasn't able to control the institutions. Uh, and in fact, all of the people that he was appointing, except his family members, right? That he also appointed. But um, but many of the people that he appointed um, were actually still loyal to the Constitution, right? Yeah. Like, you know, people like Bill Barr, people like Mike Pence, right? Um, you know, uh, you could criticize them for different things that they have done policy wise, but but in a crucial moment, they were still loyal to the constitution. And that's why you know the things didn't of powers. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So things didn't completely go crazy. Um, um, but uh, I mean, that's it's a big question. I mean, is he going to be able to succeed? I mean, with you know increasing authoritarian powers um uh that's why i think you know to stabilize the institutions you know you'd have to uh, put harris in charge um you know and then he's already said well he's not going to run again uh trump um if, if he loses uh and i hope this time it's it would be quite serious right um um yeah, we'll see what happens. I don't know. It's hard to predict, Larry. <laughs> Very hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because you have okay, you have like JD Vance. He's a, he's a young guy, and um, and he, and he's already suggesting. Well, I mean, you know, I can be, I can be the new Trump. You know, I, I can be the young guy that runs on the right wing populistic agenda. Um, but then that's why I think it's going to be very interesting. Like if Trump loses, um, because then. You know, even somebody like Vance, you know, unless you know he shifts his position one eighty, um, is not going to be able to you know win a future election, right? But maybe there's a signal finally that um, this kind of right wing populism is not able to win. There'll be an internal reform within the Republican Party. You think? Yeah, right. Uh, because they lost, you know, they lost twenty eighteen, they lost twenty twenty. Um, they, well, they won the house in 22, but they, but they still, uh, lost the Senate. Um, and then in 24, I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens now. Um, yeah. uh, but I mean, so if, but, but if let's say there is continued losses for the Republicans, you know, even with their attempts to, you know, try to remove some voters, right, um, uh, from, from from the voting rolls, right, um, you know, uh, impose more voter ID laws, right, things like that. Um, and, and they're still not able to, like, win the election, right? Um, then they, they would have to consider, okay, well, what do we do? What can we do, right? Um, and... Um, because I mean, the U.S. electoral system, and so this is, you know, uh, and the unfortunate truth is that, like, if if you can pivot better to the center, you know, you just have, you're just going to win that margin, right? It's a, it's that critical margin, right? Yeah, the critical margin that you need to win, right? Um, you know, versus like, um. Yeah, if you appeal to the extremes, then yes, you're gonna have high voter turnout within that extreme base, right? Not the center, yeah. Yeah, but the extreme yeah. base, I mean, you have maybe thirty percent, right? But you need fifty one percent, right? So, um, and 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 then that's that that that. I think the the purple states, the center plays a significant role. The purple the states that are like right on that line threshold of. Either they are, you know, light, 
let's say light blue or light purple and the center can swing a state that's why like pennsylvania is quite interesting because pennsylvania there's some states where uh you you kind of have the center mo mobilized and then you have some of the independent voters uh i don't know about like places like arizona arizona maybe it's just whatever group has a majority and whichever way it swings but i can see some states where it's yeah like you're saying the the center is very important you know uh but like in states where it's totally blue or totally red like i don't see how in texas or louisiana I don't, or you know other uh southern states i don't see how democrats have a chance because of the majority you know rule i mean because the majority they have a majority of voters and so first you know first person past the post you know wins so but even all the um I guess the only thing that might be interesting in Texas is the, the senatorial race between uh, Cruz and, and Colin Alfred. I hope I pronounced his name right, which is very close because uh, it could it could actually we don't know. I mean, I think the polls suggest that Cruz has a few percentage higher, but it's it's one of those deals where voter turnout may play a role in Texas for the senatorial race. So uh, yeah, Larry, it's difficult um yeah no. yeah yeah so that, that, that's that's uh it's the politics of the moment i suppose um yeah. it, all we don't need is a, a one little issue uh you know in the news or something that totally uh changes the the narrative of debates and you know that usually happens something happens right before and then that has a four four five percent uh swing or whatever direction it's going to swing into yeah. yeah, I I bet that like you know, uh, was it Mark Comey? Uh, the, the guy there was the FBI director at that time, right? Yeah. Uh, James James Comey, I think was this guy's name, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so I I I think he's still regretting, you know, the like the the, 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 the emails, like the Hillary oh, Clinton yeah. emails, right? I mean, like three weeks before the elections. Right, he says that. Oh, I have new evidence uh, about Hillary's emails. Right, even though I mean, like the, the email story had been out there for many, many months. Right, before that. Right. Yeah. But then he said, "Well, we'll bring it back up again." Um, and lo and behold, and you know, Trump wins the election, uh, and then Comey starts to, I think, investigate Trump for some reason. Right. Um and. And 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 then Trump fires Comey, right? Yeah, I remember that. They made a movie uh, out of that. Yeah. yeah so, in, in in that way, I mean, I think I think he must have said to himself, "Okay, well, I actually regret, um, you know, uh, having tipped the election in favor of Trump." Um, uh, and that, that that's certainly that, that, I think I think that's a story that must be, yeah. you know, following him around for a little bit, right? So, well, you never know. It might be U.S. Supreme Court too. I mean, it could. There could be a, a, a there's some votes that are thrown out. Then you have another case like you had in Florida uh, with uh, Gore versus Bush, right? It could be any institution that gets involved, whether it's judicial uh, goes to the Supreme Court, you know. So that's these are hypotheticals, you know. We don't know for sure, but this that's what makes elections so interesting because if there's anything a spectacle or any kind of event that can often you know have an impact on voting behavior so. yeah yeah and um so we yeah, are we'll, we'll, so we'll see what happens uh, with the election yeah. uh right. and uh, and i hope that um you know the things will go uh smoothly i mean there's, there's a lot of you know problems out there in the world that uh you know need to be solved um and yep. uh, and, yeah yeah and and, and yeah, I mean, and and the sad reality is that I mean, you 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 just have to, you know, manage the the global disorder. I think you know, there's there's, there's no way to stop the disorder, right? Um, I think that overall, you know, the U.S. um is, you know, it, it is becoming relatively less important, right? I mean, you have like Asia Pacific, you have China, right? Um. Yeah, you have other places that kind of become competing poles in the world, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so India you have to, too. yeah, India is becoming yeah. more significant because, yeah, their population is still growing at least until the middle of the century, right? Um, so yeah, there's going to be, yeah, opposing poles, um, uh, and, you know, you need to have like a cool level-headed U.S. leadership. I mean, not, not one that, uh, makes, you know, rash or dumb decisions. Um, uh, you know, so now, but then again, you know, like Trump's argument is like, you know, Okay, if you look at the two sources of instability, right? Eastern Europe and the Middle East, right? Um, the destabilization did happen under the Biden administration, right? So, you know, the Ukraine war, October the 7th in, in Israel, what happened after that. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it was just unfortunate uh that uh that had to coincide with the biden presidency right um, well, i think you can blame for it <laughs> being blamed for it i guess yeah we're right i mean well i mean yeah because you know the, the, the trumpian argument is that well you need to have a strong leader who scares the other leaders right um and that, that's that's a really big question. I mean, because you know, you could also make the argument that, like, even under the Trump term, uh, that there was you know significant uh, disorder, right? Um, you know, uh, you know, like, yeah, you know, there, there were already conflicts that were happening in the Middle East. Um, you know, Putin was in fact uh, already investing more in the military, so he was at some point going to attack. Um, so I'm not sure how much of a difference that, uh, Trump makes in this kind of, uh, global conflict, but, um, but I mean, but, but his statement is non-falsifiable, right? I mean, you know, because it is the case that yes, those two big wars in the Middle East and in Eastern Europe, uh, broke out under, uh, under Biden, uh, and, and Biden actually, I mean, he's, he's one of those leaders that, is the most traditional in a sense, right? Like in favor of NATO alliance, uh, in favor of commitments to, you know, Japan and South Korea and Taiwan to some extent, right? So, um, you know, he, he, like, you know, he follows the doctrine of like, okay, you know, maximum US strength is part of the broader alliance, right, system. Um. And, and Trump wasn't doing as much of that. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, you know, the U.S. effectively is doing its best to, you know, put, put a strong position forward, right? Yeah, yeah. It's surprisingly because Biden seemed more, more like a conservative than Trump during the, you know, Trump uh, period. Because you would never expect, uh, you know, Trump, didn't he uh, meet with the North Korean dictator, uh, even like pose? Yeah, with, uh, with, with Kim Jong-un, yeah. Getting a little cozy. And I would never think of that as a, from a conservative leader doing, but then, I don't know, Nixon, Nixon did meet uh, uh, Mao. With with Mao, yeah, uh, yeah. that's right. Yeah. I, I guess, yeah, so I don't know. I, I always thought Biden's more of a... He's liberal, but he's a conservative, you know, when it comes to military and like, you know. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, separating the domestic with the foreign policy, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and also, if yeah. you think like the Clinton administration was the one that cut welfare the most, right? Right. You know, and, and welfare as he, we know it. He's a liberal, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. He, he was fully committed to this kind of like, you know, this Dick Morris triangulation, right? Idea where it's like, well, you know, we have to go to the new liberals and then we have to go to the you know leftist voters and we kind of put them all together right in one program um and 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 then that, and that that's a problem because because then the democratic party is going to leave a gap right um you know it's like you, you say well you're going to cover the center ground but actually i mean the new liberal agenda is actually 
very radical in my view, right? Because you, you're saying that you're okay with, you know, sacrificing, you know, a big portion of the, you know, Budget, yeah. like working class, basically, right? Uh, and also like people who benefit from the welfare programs, right? Um, so you sacrifice that electorate so that you can get the, you know, basically a smaller slice of the, like urbanite um elites right yeah which includes people with the highest level of education uh it includes like the the rich people in silicon valley uh and maybe the wall street people right um and and, and that, that that's that's a very problematic agenda because because you have like 20 to you know 20 percent max of the electorate right yeah, it's a real um, marginal base, real small. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, these people, I mean, they're more likely to vote, right? So, I mean, like, if 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 you look at, like the total uh, vote participation might be like fifty, fifty five percent, right? Uh, and I think twenty twenty was higher. I think it was more than sixty percent. Uh, but in a normal election, you have about half of the electorate who is voting, right? So. Yeah. Um, so of course, you know, the 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 fifty percent who are not voting are uh, tend to be poor people, right? Um, they they're already like marginalized; they're written off yeah. politically, um, and they're not what's considered to be you know the center ground of American politics, right? Um, yeah, yeah, like people think that basically this, the center ground of American politics is, you know, the, the suburbs of the swing states. Basically, so if you take a state like Pennsylvania, right? Uh, you know, it's not necessarily Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, which is you know the Democratic heartland. Uh, it's not the uh, the rural countryside in Pennsylvania, right? Which is Republican. Um, but you have basically the suburbs of Philadelphia, right? Mm. Uh, and then you have the suburbs of maybe Pittsburgh too. And and that's and that's a swing vote, right? So like that Costco crowd, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm, I mean, trying Costco... to, I'm trying to stereotype now. I'm trying the Tesla driving Costco types. No? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, well, Tesla, real Tesla would be voters. like really well off, right? Teslas yeah, yeah. would be really well off. I mean, I would say, you know, people right. who drive like you know Ford or Chevy or Toyota or something, right? Um, um, and you know, like. Yeah. Um, suburban soccer moms. I mean, there, there was there was kind of another label that was given to them, right? Yeah. Are you familiar with the book by uh, Catherine Liu? Uh, and re her book was Virtue Hoarders, and she made a similar argument about um, um, like elites, uh, liberal, uh, within university system and if i remember correctly she called them professional managerial class and, and the argument was that that even like there's a there's a class kind of portrayal like this there's there's some let's say academic types not like you and me i mean but like maybe a little higher up that they have a liberal language and they are engaged in virtual signaling but but they have different vested class interests and their students might be working class, but they're a different class. And so what's happening, you know, with some institutions, maybe people are kind of abandoning uh, class interests and they have individual interests to make career, you know, and, but they're signaling, they're signaling liberal uh, virtue, you know, uh, progressive, diverse and, uh, open, you know, uh, but economically they're actually elite or they're fairly well better off than most working class people, you know. So I wondered about this more and more. I mean, because I'm not talking about acad like adjuncts, people that are adjuncts or lecturers, but people that may have tenure, you know, they they kind of are the most better off than most middle class people. They can have better incomes unless they live in a state that's anti-intellectual and they're firing everybody you know but uh, can you imagine in california like if you are a assistant professor it could be eighty thousand hundred thousand dollars a year with benefits um but you know that that is 
fairly good, decent uh, income, but the, the students that people serve, they're, they are 45000 at the most, or maybe $40,000 a year, even less than that. The, so I don't know. I, I recommend the book by Catherine Liu. She kind of uh, made this thesis about the professional managerial staff and how they kind of swing between these class interests. <laughs> You know, I don't you know, know if what? I belong to that. I don't. I don't know if I belong. I don't see myself as professional manager of class. Uh, I see myself more as a lower middle class. Uh, but I can imagine people that have higher rank. Uh, let's say if they are a, at least uh, a tenure professor, then I can see maybe they have more money and you know job security at least. <laughs> Uh, so the main idea here is that the college instructors uh, are uh, out of touch, basically, re relative to the students. Um, it means that they could they could send virtual signals that they are progressive and they're open and you know and they're pro LGBTQ and they drive a Toyota Prius, but their class interests are different from working class people because economically they. So when it comes to the economic issues, like like you yeah. have NIMBYism, right? So let, let's say if you have, um, yeah, uh, like the city wants to open, um, like uh, public housing, right? Uh, right. In, in in the neighborhood of that professor, right? You would be against it if if you were. I mean, in in your economic interest, you would be against it, but in your classroom, people would. Oh no, I'm for it. It's a cyn It's a cynicism, I guess. Uh, because class interests still matter, you know, class interests like uh, whether someone uh, has a house that they already own or some people are living in apartments and they're pay living paycheck to paycheck. But and the, they want the to home values to go down, right? If you add the, you know, the the, the public housing rights, uh, yeah. you're going to have um, like lower housing values, right? And uh, and then there will be a sacrifice, and so the, these people are going to be against it. But when it comes to issues that are not directly harming them, right? Exactly. Because if, so because if you think about it, like if say, if I'm progressive about LGBT, right? Yeah, yeah. If if I'm progressive about abortion, right? Uh, if I'm progressive about migration, right? I don't see that there is a direct harm that is applied to me, right? And I think that's what kind of a lot of Americans associate liberalism with, right? Right. Which is specifically on those social issues. Yeah. So you can be progressive on the social issues. But economically, you're um, capitalist. But economically, you're going to be... Cap well, I mean, well, for college professors, actually, I mean, I think they are in favor of higher taxes than the rich people. Okay. Because they don't consider themselves to be rich. So like, let's say if you have... Because uh, you know, if you remember, like, even Biden's tax plan, right? And he was saying, you know, nobody below four hundred thousand dollars a year is going to pay more taxes, right? Uh, and if you remember under Obama, it was like two hundred fifty thousand. So obviously, with inflation, you know, they 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 keep pushing up that uh, the threshold amount, right? Yeah. But but the signal clearly is that. You know, in in the Democratic Party's view, if you make less than four hundred thousand dollars a year, you belong to the middle class, and you're a core part of the electorate, and I'm not going to offend you, right? Well, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so I think a professor is poor enough to say, "Hey, I, I want, I want taxes to go up on the four hundred k plus because okay. you know I make less than that, right?" <laughs> so I think in that way, I mean, th these people might still be progressive, right? Okay. Um, but 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 then, you see. But, but then the I, issue is okay. We have a lot of people like who are making less than you know seventy, sixty thousand dollars a year, which you know is poverty wages nowadays, right? And um, and 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 those are the people who are like, well, okay, you know, do I still see a benefit, you know, um, uh, living and working and. Uh, and and I'm sure like many of the professors are going to be like, well, you know, I want you to be making more money, but I just want yeah. the very rich people to pay for it, right? Right, right. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely opening up a can can of worms, you know. Um, 
it's it's an interesting thesis that I, I don't quite buy into all of it, but I thought it was a unique perspective that someone uh, brought forward. Catherine Liu, uh, risk, uh, Virtue Hoarders. Yeah, that was, that's what it was called. But on a final note, I don't know. I always thought it was interesting. If you think about places like California uh, or New York, public university cost. You know, remember, these are blue states. The same thing with Washington State. Public university cost. University of Maryland. Public university cost. Um, you know, they, they, it is very expensive, and even in those states, uh, and those are blue states. I mean, I could, you could, you know, people can point to red states, and they, those public universities are also expensive. But I, I can't understand it in blue states why they can't do anything to reduce the tuition and fees at UC Berkeley or something. I mean, it's, I think it's way up there. I mean, it's, I know this is a topic that's. <laughs> controversial but it's always interested me because in blue states the argument is it's a progressive state and it's supposed to be inclusive you know and diverse um, but then the cost is in public universities is really uh, massive it's massive um, and anybody can I mean look at the websites I mean it's I don't know how much UC Berkeley is but it's up there UC Davis um, so yeah, it's pretty costly. That's the only yeah. other. That, that's like the last comment on it. The same thing with like New York, New York public university. So, I mean, uh, yeah, but it, it, what, I mean, it's it's not just the universities that are yeah. expensive, right? I mean, is it, yeah. like, every, every service, every public service just costs more uh, in those blue states, um, and yeah. um, you know they also are, you know, like urban states. Uh, they also. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are more government regulations. That's kind of the right-wing argument where it's like, you know, regulations cost money. Um, but but also, um, yeah, I mean, the, the tax structures, I mean, if they have more yeah, right, yeah. public services, you know, they'd probably be raising, you know, uh, more funds, uh, more costs with that. Um, yeah, so, that's a big thing. Uh, big yeah. Topic, yeah. Yeah, so you know, in the, in the, you know, if you have higher density places, right, uh, you might also be able to raise the cost of living in those places, right, uh, in, in especially high density regions. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's just you're gonna have a you're gonna have a higher cost structure in those places. Um, Bay, Bay Area, especially. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but but I think one thing that like I mean, so I'm not sure about what you can do with universities. Yeah. Uh, but with housing, I know that. Yeah. The blue states could significantly reduce housing expenses. Um, you know, simply by, you know, loosening the zoning laws and, you know, doing more public house building. You know, it's really yeah. a very basic thing that that, that, that they could be doing. Um, yeah, I mean, with, with universities, I think, you know, th there should be definitely more public subsidies. I think of many states, including the blue ones, I think they're reducing the budgetary expenditures, um, on, on a lot of different programs. So, um, inc including on, uh, yeah, higher education. So, so I think, yeah. It, yeah, but if you, if you but if you expand the funding for higher education, well, then you're gonna to have to raise the taxes again, and you know they're already high tax states, oh, right? Yeah, that's a class. Yeah, that's a class thing again. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and 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 then it's that, that that's all that's always where the argument is gonna be, right? It's like you know people don't want to pay more taxes, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, we had a good debate today. Okay, yep, so then we'll call the podcast an end and uh, next time, you know, we'll uh, we'll have more elections to, to comment upon and, uh, yeah. you know, more events happening around the world, right? All right. Okay. Cool.